Hello, I'm Sora Luxon, and this is Lesson 27, Geomancy. You'll have to excuse me. The video might look a little bit different today, or the sound quality might be a little bit different. You'll have to forgive me for that. I'm trying something different out here in order to record this video because someone's asked for a very specific tutorial, more of a step-by-step -step technique based on my own personal hermetic background. So I'm going to have to record it this way, and hopefully it works out well. So geomancy was used most by Renaissance magi or Renaissance magicians. That's when it was relied heavily on. And it's a very informed, highly complex type of divination reading. Some would say even more complex than the tarot. Although geomancy is usually in occult traditions taught before a tarot spread or reading. Geomantic divination by hermetic tradition, specifically is in accordance with earth elementals. That is what you would be communicating with. And it's reflective of very powerful planetary spirit evocation as well, if you're coming from an Enochian background. What does that mean? Well, it means in an advanced adept's practice, a trance state is induced via the correctly applied system of ceremonial magic, right, the steps to get there, the practitioner, that adept, can then come into contact and directly communicate with earth elementals, for instance. Another way of approaching this event psychologically is to perceive it as a heightened intention to allow the conscious mind to interact in an interpretable way with the subconscious, which has access already to this much fuller perception of its own undeniable connection to the earth and to that information. The earth's powers, the constant correspondences we share with the earth, right? Thereby allowing that subconscious information to come forward and present the information it obtains to the conscious mind in a meaningful way. Another way geomancy can be used is to make contact with or communicate with a planetary spirit directly that's something you're usually only going to see someone from a slightly more advanced hermetic Enochian background do. To do that specifically you would need to include the planet sigils, ceremonial names, and evocations pertaining to that planet spirit that's being evoked. When working with earth spirit or evoking answers from earth elementals, you obviously don't use planetary evocation, right? Because you're focusing on earth, but instead you're going to communicate with the energies of the earth directly. Generally applying the astrological houses and their corresponding associations to a geomantic reading is how it's done. It's how it's been done historically, right? Traditionally throughout time and even now commonly, modernly, persistently into the current day, into current times. So generally, there is an aspect of astrology in play here, no matter how someone's practicing the geomantic arts. Geomantic readings are usually the purview of an individual who has already completed their origin initiations. So this is going to be somebody that is already going to be able to come into contact, for instance, with an earth elemental. It's somewhat for the more experienced practitioner of spirit evocation, right? So someone who's already done that. Ceremonial magic practices that they've done usually for at least a year, possibly two, right? Or someone who's had a year or two advancing themselves in their understanding and the ability of working with heightened circle magic practices. Just as a common rule to watch for in what you're doing or perhaps learning from someone else to do, an authentic, a genuine geomantic reading is going to involve astrological measurement in the time the reading is done. There is going to be some acknowledgement of that, of the day, of the time, of which planets are in alignment where. Even if it's only a minor acknowledgement, that acknowledgement is going to be made as the reading or the divination is being done. That's information, right? That sort of research reference material that you would need can easily fill massive books and take up tons and tons of its own videos, tons of its own podcasts. So I'm not going to get into all the astrological details here, 
But certainly, if you're doing these readings, you will want to, and you'll want to begin applying that information to your work as a magical practitioner in order to have your geomantic readings function correctly and most powerfully. If you're just asking a question in communion with the earth, I would say at very least you would need an earth pentacle present, but you could ask that question within a cast circle safely. That would be another way to do it, to just receive one geomantic figure in response to one direct question. I've seen people do that. And I'll show you what I mean by geomantic figure. I'm going to specify all of this for you. But you could do that. You don't necessarily have to go through the entire process that I'm going to show you. But if I were even doing the smallest type of authentic reading, which I'm not going to do today, right? I'm not going to be doing real magic on camera. I'm going to be doing the technique, the steps. I'm not invoking or evoking anything. I'm not casting a circle. If I were doing an actual reading, I would of course first cast a circle and then at very minimum, I would cast an invoking earth pentagram I would then place the sigil of the necessary planet into that pentagram. Like if I were asking a question about the success of something, whether or not something's going to have a successful outcome, if that were my question. Success is correspondent to the sun, right? That's, that's the planet of authority, success, and majesty. So I would use the success planetary spirit's sun sigil, Sora, and that sigil, that name, would then be placed into the earth invoking type pentagram, which would also be within my cast circle. And there's no way I'd be doing any sort of a geomantic reading without an earth pentacle present as well. But the full Enochian system that I do use, it's really long, it's really complicated, so I'm not going to go through the whole process and ceremony here. You can research it if you like. I've mentioned books before that can lead you towards that information. And of course, there are groups that you could practice this type of mentorship magic with. But not every tradition of the occult uses or requires the entire ceremony that mine does. So I'm just going to stick to explaining the basic technique of this form of high magic, and then you can preface it however you choose to in whatever way works best or is safest for you. So to get started here on the actual technique, all I have here is my actual geomantic kit from the Lux Occult Shop. This is what I use in my actual readings, which is why I've chosen to make it available for other people to purchase so that if it works well for them, they can have one as well. You do not have to have this exact altar cloth. You do not need this exact kit. Absolutely not. Traditionally, if you go far enough back, geomancy was done in black dirt or soil or white sand that was held in a vessel of some kind, a framework, and you would then make dots at random or marks with a stave or stick or wand into that soil or sand. And you would get your odd or even numbers to create a geomantic figure with that way. And I'm going to show you, I'm going to explain to you what that is. But keep in mind that you could choose to do that. That might be what works best for you. Within the last 100 to 200 years, a white linen cloth is the most traditional functioning high magic surface for the casting of stones, which is how I'm going to do my reading. It's how I do my readings and it's what I'm going to show you. But you don't need this altar cloth that I make from my shop, right? You could use a white cloth napkin that's been blessed and made sacred by you and then sealed or anointed with salt and oil. Um, it's really up to the practitioner what method of tool is going to work best for them. For instance, this is what I use. It's what works best for me. All that's in this little pouch are pebbles. Obviously, you don't have to buy pebbles from someone. You could, and it could be very useful to you, take the time to go out and collect these stones, these little rocks, for yourself. That act of intention, as you would be going out to find these and becoming more aware of your own environment, 
that is going to empower what tool you're then using to work with later. So you might not even want to buy something like this from someone. You might want to go ahead and make it yourself. That might make it the best possible tool for you to be using. All things just to keep in mind. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you really quick just how you would go about, just a piece of paper and a pen, making your first geomantic figure. Again, here's that little pouch. I'm just reaching into that pouch and pulling out some pebbles. Obviously, if I were doing real magic, there wouldn't be paper on my cloth. There would certainly be a circle cast, everything I mentioned before. This is just the steps, the actual technique. So you would cast your pebbles, stones. If you're making marks in the sand, this is when you'd be making those marks. And all you're going to do is then count it up, whether it's pebbles that you're using or marks that you're making, you're counting them up after you cast them. And you're counting them up, not because you need the number, but only because you need to know whether it's an even or an odd number. So here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. See, that's it. That's all you're doing. So that's an odd number. Now when you're making a geomantic figure, an odd number gets one mark or one dot. And you are gonna need to be able to record that somewhere. That's why I have this paper here, right? So I'm just gonna do that exact same thing over again. I'm just going to be reaching into this little bag. There it is. Now, when I'm doing this, let's say my question that I was looking for an answer to was, will it rain tomorrow? This is the part of the reading, the part of the divination you're doing where you're focusing on that question. It's as you reach into the bag and randomly pull out these stones. This is where you're asking for information and it's then being given to you. So in my mind internally, I would be intentfully focused on that question. It may help you to repeat that question out loud over and over again as you're making your marks or grabbing your stones to cast just over and over again. Will it rain tomorrow? Will it rain tomorrow? Will it rain tomorrow? This is the part of the reading where you're doing that part of the process. So again, I've pulled my little pebbles here. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now eight is an even number. Even numbers get two marks. That is really all there is to making a geomantic figure. You're looking for an odd or even number. An odd number gets one mark or dot. An even number gets two marks or dots. Just reaching back into that bag, show you again here. Casting these little pebbles and then counting them up. One, two, three, four. I know some of them are hard to see. Sorry about that, guys. Five, six, seven, eight. Eight is an even number, so two dots. Now, as you can see, when I am writing these dots, these little marks out, right? One dot for odd numbers, two dots for even numbers, right? You can see that I'm doing it in lines. See that? That there's going to be four rows, if you will, or lines going down. That's how you make a geomantic figure. I'll show you here. Here's a chart of geomantic figures. This is what geomantic figures look like. See that? These series of dots, it's always in lines of four because that's how you make the figure. So obviously I only have three here, three little rows so far, so I need one more. Back into the bag, focusing on that question, will it rain tomorrow? Randomly gra grabbing a handful of pebbles, casting them onto whatever surface I'm using, two, four, six. That's an even number. So even numbers get two dots. There you go. There's your first geomantic figure. I'm just gonna redraw it for you so you can see what it looks like without all those little lines. That's it. That is your first geomantic figure. Now you're going to repeat this process many times over. So you'd actually have to do it a minimum of another three times. You need to come up with a minimum of four geomantic figures total. So here's one. So I would then do this again and make another figure, and then again, and make another figure, and then again, and make another figure for a total of four. Those four figures are called 
the four mothers. And you use them on a natal chart, the map of heaven. And I'm going to show that to you and how that works. But you would get four full geomantic figures. So I'm just going to make up four at random. So here's that first one. One more time, I'm going to write it out that we did get from actually casting those stones. I'm not gonna keep doing it over and over again because it would take a really long time. So let's pretend that I've then done that again and I've come up with another figure, right? I cast stones, I came up with an odd number, I got one dot. I cast stones, I came up with an even number, I got two dots. Then I cast them again, I got an odd number, and then I cast them again, I got an odd number. So here would be my second figure. Now, as I said, I'm just gonna randomly make some here. I would do this a total of four times, just like that. So here I would have my four geomantic figures, which I've now found by making marks, casting stones, however you're doing it. Set that aside. So there's my first four figures. These are my four mothers. Now, let me show you what a natal table map of heaven looks like. This, I include this in my little kit, but you can easily find this information online. You don't have to buy it from someone. You could even, if you chose to, I could show you right here, you could use a blank piece of paper of your own and you could make this chart. See that? So you do not have to buy these things. Not the greatest table I've ever freehanded with one hand on camera, but <laughs> you get the idea. That's the same thing as this. So you don't have to buy it from someone and you can't find the information online. You could also just draw it yourself on a clean white piece of paper. So here is our natal chart. Natal charts, astrological charts tend to be circular now, but this really is the same thing. It is the same map of heaven and it displays, as you can see, the same 12 astrological houses. And in the center, you then have two witnesses, witness one, witness two, and this, which is called the judge. The judge would be the answer to your question in a full reading. This is going to be the most important information that you're going to receive in the end. So a little bit of explanation required here, right? Like I said, this is a complicated video. That's why I'm going real quick today. And I'm just trying to give you the basics. Those four geomantic figures we got earlier, there they are again. Let's see if I can actually get this all on here for you. There they are, right? And I told you these are called the four mothers. Now let me show you why in this table, from my own personal traditional background, we begin in what is known as the South. That's house number 10. If this was the South, if this was the East Ascendant, see, this is where having some astrological background actually comes in handy. Measurements of the day that you're doing a reading, those sorts of things. And there's also other stuff that I'm not going to get into here today, like the hidden 16th figure, some kinds called the reconciler. Um, that's more complicated and complex. It's not necessary for a good or clean reading. I'm not going to go over it. There's also the part of fortune, which looks like this, which is sort of its own separate thing, which would fall into a house and have a corresponding meaning to which house it's in. I'm not going to go over that. Those are just more complex little details. You can look into them if you want. But what I am going to show you here. So here we have South, East Descendant, and we had our four mothers, right? This is where our first mother would go. Now they're called mothers because this is where our second mother would go. Here's where our third mother, I don't know if I'm writing this in a way that you can read legibly, but third mother would go into house four there. Fourth mother into house seven. Okay. So there's those four figures that we found either casting stones or making marks. So here's our first mother, right? It would go right here, right into this house. Not doing a great job because I'm trying to 
keep everything on camera for you, which is actually a little bit more complicated than I thought it would be. Here's where your second mother would go. Right, that, that's that figure there. So here's the third figure. So it would go into the third mother's house, which is the fourth house. Right, and here's this one. The dots that I just literally made up, right? Because otherwise it would take too long to cast that many stones and receive that many figures. So there you go. There's the four mothers. There's your geomantic figures and how to make them, right? And find them. Once you get them, based on odd or even counts, they then go into the houses on your chart or your table. It's not too, too complicated, right? So now it gets a little more complicated. <laughs> so in my own tradition, in my own background, we move clockwise. So when we're then labeling the rest of our chart, we're going to be going this direction. See that? It's not too bad, right? This would be north. This would be west. Okay. And like I said, this would be the, a witness. Witness. Judge goes here. Now there are after you've received your four mothers, you're going to create your four daughters. And your daughters, right, you're going to be creating four more geomantic figures just like you've already done. And they're called the daughters because they come from the mothers. And those daughters go right next to the mothers. See how that works? So your first daughter is going to go here into house 11. Your second, See, there's the mother, right? So it's gonna go right there, right into that next one. Second daughter goes here. Here's your third mother, right? Daughter, right next to it. Third mother, third daughter, sorry, goes here. And then there you go, one more time. Here's where your fourth daughter, your fourth geomantic daughter figure is going to go here into your eighth house. Now, how do you get those? Well, you don't cast stones and you don't make marks anymore. So this actually gets a little bit faster and a little bit easier. All you're going to do for your first daughter is go around to the mothers and take all their heads. You're ta <laughs> so if you look at a geomantic figure and think of it like a body, like here's the head up top and here's the feet down at the bottom, right? Say maybe head, chest, you know, lower torso, groin area, and then feet. So... Here, you're just gonna be going around and taking all the heads. So here you have one, two, right? That's that first mother's head, that first line right there, two dots. Here's your first daughter, one, two. Go to the next mother, what's her head? Oh, it's one dot, right? Third, go to her head, two dots. Fourth mother, what's her head? Four dot, two dots for your fourth line. See, that's it. Let me go ahead and do that again in case I went too fast or it's confusing. So now moving on to creating your second daughter, right? So what you're going to do is you're going to do the same thing, starting with the first mother and moving around, but now you're not going to the head, right? Now you're going to the neck. You're going to that second line down, that second column row, however you want to think of it. You're going to be gathering those. So in order to make my second daughter, I'm going to my first mother. I didn't draw this very well, I don't think. I think it's supposed to be one dot here, right? <laughs> so one, go to the neck of the next mother. Two, again, the neck of the third mother is two. And going over here, right? Here's your fourth mother. You're always working with the mothers, but you've already used her head in the first daughter. You're making the second daughter, so you're going to the second line. There's the neck, it's another two. See that? So how do you think this one's gonna go, right? So now we're going on to making the third daughter. Third daughter means you go to the third mother's line. So here we go, here's our mothers. First, second, third, and fourth mother. We always start with the first, we always move clockwise. We've already used the first line, we've already used the second line. Now we're going to the third, right? We're going to, I don't know, the knees. 
we're going to add second above the bottom in order to create the third daughter. So here we have two. Again, right there, one. Again, third line down, one. Go back to that last mother. One, two, three, third line down is two. There's your third daughter. And then in order to make your fourth, you're going to be going and collecting the fourth, the bottom line from each mother. So right here you have two. Here you have one. Find that third mother, where is she? Right there, what's at the bottom? Two. Find that fourth mother, where is she? Right here, all the way to the bottom, four. Four lines down, two dots. And there you have your next daughter. And then you're going to actually then create these. These are sometimes called the nieces to fill in these houses here. In my own tradition, they're actually not called the nieces. They're called the respondents. It doesn't really matter what you call them. You're going to be receiving them in the same way you just made the daughters, but instead of going to the mothers to create them, you're going to go to the daughters. So mothers spawn daughters, daughters spawn nieces. See how that works? It keeps it all pretty easy to remember. So here is where your first niece or your first respondent would be. So mother, daughter, respondent. See, mother, daughter, respondent. Just like that, all the way around. So in order to get this, you're going to be going not to your mothers, but to your daughters. And you're going to be doing it in the exact same way. So here you have your first one. So you're going to go to the first line right here of the first daughter. Go to the head. That's two. Find that next daughter and go to the head. One dot. Find that third daughter. Go to the head. Two dots. Go to that fourth daughter. Go to the head. Two dots. There you go. There's your first niece. Or respondent. Doesn't really matter what you call it. You're going to do the same thing here. I'll just go ahead and do it for you really quickly. So here's your second one. Go back to your first daughter, except now you're not going to the head. You've already used that. You're still drawing from the daughters. That's where nieces come from. But now you're going back to that neck, right? Because this is the second one. So it's the second line. So here you have one dot. Find the next daughter. Where is it? Right here. You've already used the head, so go to that neck or that second line down, two dots. Find the third daughter, where is it? Right here, one. And find the fourth, one. Okay, there's your second niece or second respondent, however you wanna think of it. You're gonna do the same thing here. You're gonna go back to the daughters, but now you're not going to the head or the neck, right? You're going to that third line down. You're making your third niece, so you're using the third line down. So here you have two from that first daughter, two from that second daughter, two, whoa, one from the third, and two from the fourth. There's your third niece. Taking the time to write this out in case you need to go back through the video to refer to what I'm doing. I know I'm moving fast. And then here, your fourth daughter, so your fourth daughter, daughters come from nieces, right? Fourth, fourth line. So there's your first daughter. What's in the fourth line? Two dots. I know I'm confusing it by adding more dots by accident, sorry. Find that second daughter, bottom line, two dots. Third daughter, bottom line, two dots. Fourth daughter, bottom line, two dots. There you go. See, that's not so bad. So now you have your four mothers, your four daughters, your four nieces. Now you're going to create your two witnesses come next. Now the two witnesses come from the ninth and tenth figures by adding them. No, the right witness comes from the ninth and tenth figures. The left witness comes from the eleventh and twelfth. I'll go ahead and show you. Here on this map, witness number one, the right witness, would be the 12th and 3rd house. 
which is here. I'm just gonna put a little star, right? And here. See, it's coming from the nieces. So your first witness comes from the first two nieces. And the way you get that is by adding the numbers up and then seeing if they're odd or even. So here you have one, two, three. See, I'm adding the heads of both, both the nieces. Two dots, one dot. One, two, three. What is that? That's an odd number. Odd numbers get one dot. Now I'm going to the next of the first two nieces. One, one, two. Again, an odd number. So one dot. Right here, third row or line, however you want to think of it. One, two, three. Odd number again. One, two, We're going right to the feet, right to the bottom, that fourth line. One, two, three. There you go. There's your first witness. So where do you think you're going to get your next witness from? Exactly. It's the other two nieces. So drawing from them. Where's my other niece? Here. Ninth house. Forgot to label her. Sorry about that. Fourth niece. <laughs> so drawing from these two in order to create your next witness, go to the heads. You have one, two, one, two. That's four. Four is an even number. So two dots. Going to the next of both, right? Here and here. One, two, three, four. Again, even, two dots. Right down here, say the knees, however you want to think of it. One, one, two, that's three. That's an odd number. And then one, two, one, two. So an even number. See that? So your witnesses come from your nieces. So mothers into daughters, daughters into nieces, nieces into witnesses. And then the judge, of course, is going to come from these two witnesses in the exact same manner. So you're going to have one, two, three, that's an odd number. One, two, three is an odd number. One, two is an even number. One, two, three is an odd number. There you go. Now, unfortunately, I think I must have messed up in a calculation or miscounted something somewhere because generally speaking, this should be an even figure, <laughs> but that's okay. I don't want to go back over it and find where I made whatever small error I did. Just be careful, obviously, when you're going through and mapping out your own geomantic figures. Maybe don't be in such a rush as I am to get it into one video. So now that you've done that, now that your entire house has been filled, or every house has been filled inside of your map of heaven, your natal chart here, each of these houses astrologically corresponds to different things. So this is where you would then begin to get your reading from the, I don't know, the 12th house for instance has to do with like enemies, fears, sorrows, hidden things, bondage, punishment. So that is where that part of that reading would come from, corresponding to the figure that's there. Your, say, fourth house has to do with inheritance or the ends of things or fathers or authority figures in that way. Your sixth house, say, could have to do with employees, smaller animals, possible illnesses, things of that nature. Uh, seventh house, of course, on any astrological chart is always love, marriage, spouses, partnerships, stuff like that. So you can see that that's all information you can find online. What all of the astrological houses are and what their influences are. And then these figures pertain to those influences. Again, this is something I include in my kit. You can find this information online. But here you can see all the different geomantic figures laid out, right? Here you have their astrological correspondence. See that? Pretty simple. See? Taurus, Gemini. Here you have their elemental correspondences. 
air, earth, fire, water, right? Hot moisture, cold moisture, you get the idea. They all come with a sex. Each one has what the word means from its Latin name, because something say like, when you're looking at this, these are all Latin names. So via is a word in Latin. And you can go ahead and look it up right here. What does it mean? Way or journey. So that's laid out here. So each of these names means something. And then each is actually under its own genius and then also ruled by its own ruler. These are the names of those elementals or angels, depending. And then you have your planetary spirit alignments as well. See that? Moon, obviously, sun, if you know your planet signs and symbols. So that's how you go about making a geomantic reading, right? This is a full geomantic reading. You would then need this information. You would apply it to which houses, which astrological houses are, and what their correspondences are. And then you could go ahead and draw information from here. You also have things... You know, if you were doing a full reading, you would have things like whether or not a specific figure falls or springs into another house, which has to do with whether or not it repeats itself. You also have whether something is facing Dexter or Sinister. That is going to have an influence on your reading. And then you're also going to go ahead and need, there's going to be a table that's going to let you know how a figure is feeling within each house. That's what I call it, is feeling. So say C conjunctio falls into your third house. Conjunctio, I'm not looking at the actual reference table right now, but conjunctio in each house is either going to feel really good, feel good, feel bad, or feel really evil. And so say it falls into your third house and when you look it up on the chart, conjunctio in your third house means really evil. That's going to obviously influence how your reading is done, how your question is answered. But overall, just know that this, this answer here, this final answer, this is the answer, right? This is what the overall intention of the entire reading, this is the information you're going to receive, you're going to find it in the judge and as I said you really can just ask one question cast stones or make marks create one geomantic figure if you're doing it in a safe way I suggest you always do it within a circle at the very least and with an earth pentacle present or at least invoke an earth pentagram but you can ask one question get one geomantic figure and then apply it to the tables and see what is being said there what is being advised so that is how you do a geomantic reading i don't know go ahead and show you this one again just in case you want to not have to look it up somewhere else and i am sora luxon i hope that wasn't too rushed or too confusing i hope it helps a little bit of course, there's a lot of information and you can find more on specific questions and answers you might have about this online. Until next time.